us again. Can you give us the next uh, slide, please, honey? Medium sized Simmental bull, very, very masculine. You can see his heavy forequarter darkening of the neck area and the lower hind, uh, hind quarter, and very good tester size. And the same here, you'll find cows that are very feminine, look like dairy cows, as you see in the next slide, please. Look at that cow. That's a typical wedge shape that we talked about that looks more like a dairy shape than what we're accustomed to. And that is how a good hormonally balanced beef cow will look like. The only difference between a cow, a dairy cow and a beef cow, apart from the shape, is the, is the fleshing. Beef cows have better fleshing or should have better fleshing than dairy cows. Next slide, please. Okay, the common denominator of all animals, regardless of environment, is a relatively small frame and hormonal balance, as you can see in these two bulls here. Two different types, one is adapted to a tropical environment, another one to a temperate environment. But if you just look at the outline of those two bulls, disregarding this large hump here, where they store fat, they have virtually the same shape. So it's good meat to bone ratio, good, good hormonal balance, a length of body relative to the height, um, those are all attributes of a good beef animal, regardless of environment. The only difference an environment requires is adaptation to, to climate, nutrition, and parasite diseases. But both these animals would be adapted to a low nutritional level, or relatively low nutritional level. Next, please. Here you have again the, the height length ratio of this very fertile masculine bull. Darkening here, darkening there. And the way he's looking at you shows he's testosterone aggressive. He's, he's not, he doesn't have a bad temperament, but he's just telling you that he's, he's in charge of this pasture here. Next, please. Another one. Height to bone uh, length ratio, very clear. And what you also find animals that have a good meat to bone ratio, there's a couple of correlations that go with it. One is a very tight sheath, a relatively fine bone. And in the cows, you'll find a very neat udder with very small teats. That all goes together. What if you, cows? Sorry? What did you say about the cows? Cows will have a relatively small udder with small teats. It correlates to that good meat to bone ratio and a tight sheath. If you find an animal with very heavy bone, like some uh, cattle do have, you will find cows that have got sloppy udders, saggy udders, big teats, and often curved cervix as well which goes to the big sheath. So if you're similar in cows and you find curved cervix, it'll be because of that. A lot of your heavier bone cow have curved cervix. A lot of them do, yes. If it correlates with the, it normally correlates with the, with the large sloppy sheath, then you get the curved cervix as well. And big cervix, very big cervix. This particular animal here. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. It just shows the form of, of a, a functional animal, regardless of environment. Yeah. Next, please. And this is a man-made problem. What happened here is, uh, obviously genes inherited, at least the hormones inherited through genes. But what you have here is a, I imagine as a, as a cow or heifer that was uh, relatively hormonally balanced. But because the owner put in the show ring, and wanted large cows, he kept her from breeding. So she was about four, uh, four years old when this photograph was taken. He probably tried breeding at three years old and she co he couldn't get in a calf. And that is the problem with a lot of early maturing, sexually early maturing cattle. If you don't breed them young, and they're withheld from the bull for a year or so, then they start developing a hormonal imbalance. And you have difficulty getting them a calf, as you see in this extreme example here. Next, please. The wedge shape you can see very clearly here. You look at that, the dairy outline. And here's the shoulder blade I was talking about. You can see that how prominent that shoulder blade is. In fact, that shoulder blade is higher than the vertebrae. Because this is a cow that carved at two, and she's carved every single year after that. That's her sixth calf or seventh calf at the age of eight. What you'll see here is a very feminine, thin neck, and you'll find no fat deposits on the brisket. So it's a very lean a neck and a brisket with that uh, uh, skin fold there. Next one. Exactly the same here. 
the wedge shape. Anyone guess how old that cow is? 14. Sorry? 15. She's 18 years old, and that's her 17th calf. So we can forgive her for that saggy udder there. I've seen photographs of when she was a five-year-old, she had a perfect udder. 18 years old with the 17th calf. In fact, that's a, that's a KCB master from Albany and Texas. Yeah. I mean, that cow, she looks like a, just a large Jersey cow. Which shape? Is that calf bull type? No, they do own their cattle. No, yeah, they, they surgically own, that's why they look like, as though they're polled, but they're not polled. The calf's been dehorned It'll be dehorned at an early age as well. He's got a surgical way of doing it. I think he just cuts off the, cauterizes the, the blood to the horn butt. He's also a vet. Yeah. So he does that. I'm I think it's, is it? So it's a time consuming operation, is it? Well, for burn them off, it doesn't go through. No, but he doesn't do that. I think he just cauterizes the blood somehow through surgical method. I don't think he burns it. Like we just burn with a hot iron. He actually oh, cuts, he actually cauterizes, the, he cuts off the blood vessel somehow. And it's a very neat, you can see that cow looks as though well, she's pulled, but she's not naturally pulled. Next one, please. Now here's a cow that wouldn't win a show prize, and here's a bull calf with a poor back, but that's not what I want to show you. This is a nine month old bull calf, and look how masculine he is. Look at the defined muscling, the very darkening of the forequarter. These little bull calves are able to serve cows and heifers and impregnate them at that age. How important is the lack of straight back? Yeah, well that's not ideal. Uh, it can become a problem if you're not aware of it, but it can become extremely bad. I've seen it, so that I'm just mentioning that it's not an ideal back that. But what I want to show you is how masculine is at, the, at nine months of age. You'd want to breed him even though he's got a sway back? Sorry? You'd want to breed him even though he's... No, I wouldn't, I didn't breed from him. I you wouldn't... wouldn't breed that I wouldn't know. No. I sold him there. <laughs> uh, not that I'm being dishonest by selling him, I mean people are aware of that, but I wouldn't like those genes to concentrate it. That is not a problem, but it can become a problem if you keep on using bulls that have got that problem. Next one. Here's another example I showed you earlier. Uh, eight to nine month old calf. Look at the defined muscling there. The, the cow's already weaned the calf. But look at the darkening of the forequarter there. And then high, all indications of high testosterone level. And the, the sleek coat. It looks as though you've rubbed them with an oily rag. Next, please. His back is good. Mm. This is an eight-year-old cow with a seventh calf here and in, in calf again, pregnant again. It's a three-month-old calf, so she's pregnant. There again, look at that shoulder blade. How prominent that shoulder blade is relative to the, the vertebrae. And again, she's wedge-shaped. The next slide I'll show you is with a previous two years progeny. She produced two bull calves prior to that. Next, please. There she is with a heifer calf. That's a 15-month-old bull calf and that's a 27-month-old bull calf. At 27 months, two and a quarter years, look at the muscling. How the testosterone, because testosterone is related to muscle and not to fat. So a bull would have very uh, um, uh, mass, high mass of muscle, muscle definition, and he'd be inclined not to put on body condition. Although they might, they would have an inherently good body condition. Bulls, it's a negative, testosterone is negative body condition. If you look at uh, calves at weaning, your heifer calves are always in better body condition. They look sleeker, they look better because of the estrogen. Where the bulls are more lean type because of the testosterone. So testosterone does, so that's why you have that lean type uh, of animal because of higher testosterone levels. Next. Uh, this is a cow I'll show this. I made a mistake in never breeding a bull from this particular cow uh, because she, she didn't have too much milk she had about average milk, average weaning weights for her calves. And at that time, uh, uh, unknowingly, I made a mistake by selecting for too much milk. I should have kept a bull from that cow. Because that's the type of cow, and the progeny would have been the ones that would have been able to um, have, still have good body condition under poor nutrition and non-selective grazing. So that's a reminder that I made a mistake, that cow there. By too much milk, you mean they 
had too little body condition because they made so much milk? We see milk has priority over body condition in terms right. of nutrients. So that genetically they had so much milk, so that genetically they had to satisfy the milk production first and then body condition. So the nutrients weren't enough in a certain circumstances for them to have expressive milk potential and have good body condition. So it's very important with beef cattle that we don't breed dairy cattle that require dairy nutrition. Next please. Here's another cow that looks like a Jersey cow. Look at that shape. These are all two-year-old cows that uh, carved at two years and reconceived again. Under those conditions I was telling you about, right in the middle of the rainy season where we get 40 inches of rain over four months, and then we have eight month dry season. So this is a couple of months into the dry season. So they carved in very good condition as two year olds, and they still have very good condition a couple of months into the dry season, and they're pregnant again. I could not have done that without uh, carving at that specific time, unless I put too much uh, nutrition into them in terms of inputs, feed. I could, wouldn't have been able to do it. Next please. And here's that cow again, that sloping rump. Uh, again, to many people that doesn't look like a good beef cow, but she's giving everything to a calf. She's got a very good hormonal balance, high estrogen levels. She's in calf again, and that's the type of cow that will calve regularly under, under poor nutrition. Next. And this is a group of them that calved at two years of age, had the second calf at three, and with their first calves. I was also told when I changed my breeding season to the middle of the rainy season, where we have a lot of parasites and diseases and ticks, that the calves that, were born, that would be born that time would not be worth having. Now these are calves I was very happy with, and a large percentage of them, even from first calving cows, were able to calve at two years of age again. Previous picture. Just go back. Oh. Do you know how old that calf is right there? How old? I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I'm you, guessing she's probably about five, six months old. Would you leave her on that cow for nine months or not? Well, I left them on the cows until, you see, with these cows, what happens is when they, when they uh, over a 42 day breeding season, when they become pregnant, they dry up very early as well. So by seven, eight months, most of the cows will be dry. Okay. Yeah. So they wouldn't produce milk much, unless they weren't pregnant, much more than seven or eight months. They dry them up by themselves and be the calves. Next, please. Okay, so what's very important to understand is two things. One is that in a bull, what we've been talking about, visual assessment has predictive value in bulls. Okay, so I can look at a bull. This bull is 15 months old. And at 15 months, I could tell, and anyone can tell that he's got a high degree of testosterone, very, very masculine. And these are the same bull at five years of age. So in a bull it's predictive. At a young age you can identify those bulls. What I must uh, tell you about this bull, this bull I took the photograph at the AI station and they'd be feeding him the same ration as all the other beef bulls. And he was getting too fat as you can see there. So they had to cut his ration in half, which is a good indication to me that I had been selecting for inherently good body condition. But the point is that it has predictive value in a bull. At a young age, 12 months, even younger, you can identify an early maturing, sexually maturing bull that's got high levels of testosterone. But in the cow, it's not the same. In the cow, it's historical. It's not, it has no predictive value. Just go on the next one, please, Hami. Who can tell me by looking at that heifer there, that's a mother there, that heifer calf at eight months of age, that she's going to calve at two years of age and, and have a calf every year after that? You can't do it. No one can do it. No one can walk into a group of 100 heifers and identify them in terms of fertility and rank them from the most fertile to the least fertile. So we can't do it. So with the cow, it's historical. So, but what happens, this heifer here was bred at 15 months and she calved, that's her there. She's a two-year-old cow there. Look how her body conformation has changed. As an eight-month-old eight to a two-year-old cow there. Totally different. That's because of the hormones start working when they become pregnant. So that's historical value. Now if I have the records of those cows, I can identify, as we said earlier this morning, which is the most fertile. By looking into calving periods, or, or uh, date between, or time between calving and first cycle, then we can categorize them and rank them in terms of fertility if we correct for seasonal effects. So the cow, it, we have to keep records. But I can go into, and anyone else can go into a herd of cows with no records, 
and I'll be able to identify the cows that calved at an early age and calved regularly after that. But again, it's historical. So what you see there is the, the history. It's not predictive. And how did you identify your cows? Did you tag them or brand them? I'll brand them. Okay. They've got a brand on the shoulder that you can't see there. They have a brand on the shoulder. I'll brand them on the shoulder there. What I did is at, at, uh, as calves, I gave them ear notches with a notcher. And it's a very, very simple system because you don't, I never use tags. So the ear notch, I can go up to 1,610. Not many of us have that many calves a year. And then I would brand the same number on the cow with a year number on it. So that, that is my method of, of numbering the cattle. Very simple. I can show you an example if anyone's interested. Very, very simple. Next one. Practical fertility refers to a good hormonal balance and good body condition. Now you can see these two bulls are very hormonally balanced. They're all very masculine. This, the difference is this is a small frame bull. This is a composite I bred. And this, this I bred a composite from this type of beef master. So the beef master was medium frame and the composite was small frame with a very high practical fertility. Although both are hormonally balanced, the smaller frame animal is able to put on body condition much easier. So his female progeny will have a higher fertility because of that. Because practical fertility, cow fertility, is dependent on both hormonal balance and good body condition. And body condition, we have a choice. It's either through breeding. If it's not through breeding, then we have to feed them enough to get good body condition for them to calve. Next, please. Again, body condition, hormonal balance, small frame, optimum milk, large frame, too much milk. This, this calf weighed 800 pounds at weaning, far too much milk. Uh, very close to well over 60% of his mother's weight, 70% of his mother's weight. Whereas this one's about 50, 55% of the mother's weight. So we can breed too much milk into our beef cows. Next, please. Selecting bulls for fertility, we just, I'm just going to go through it quickly. We discussed it this morning. High practical fertility, a very early maturing. Low practical fertility, even if he had a good hormonal balance, which he doesn't have, he doesn't have the body condition to uh, pass it on to his female progeny. So this bull can't even fatten the feedlot. How do you expect his female progeny to fatten on grass? It won't happen. So 12 months of maturity and hormones, they go together. So the early maturing animal will have a lower hip height. And look at this animal here. A lot of bone. A lot of skin if you in the hide business or shoe business or handbag business or bone meal business, then I suppose he has got value. But otherwise, in our business, he has no value at all. Next, please. Again, selecting cows for corrected in the calving period, two and three year old calving. And this one actually carved at three years for the first time because she was too large frame. Next. Maybe you can uh, reduce the size a little bit, honey. Okay. Well, anyway, what yeah, it is yeah. it? Okay. So what you, this is a 17-month-old bull, um, composite bull that I bred. So it's a combination of beef moss and mashona. And just again to show the masculinity, you can see the darkening there, and you can see the uh, defined muscling developing already. Did, did you use I guess a red mashona bull? On the I used a red mashona bull, yes. Because I had the option, remember I, I used semen from uh, Mishona bulls. So I had the option of selecting very good red bulls that were well muscled. And on my beef master cows that had the genes for muscling, 90% came out well muscled. The other way around didn't work too well. When I used Mishona cows with a good beef master bull, I didn't get the same results. Because the Mishona cows on average didn't have the genetic muscling that the beef master cows had. So that's important when you're thinking of composite breeding, to do the right combinations. Next. Again, this bull, yeah, I saw him earlier. Big, large testers. Look at his height relative to length and this extreme muscling, defined muscling you see there. Very thick neck, thick, very wide shoulders, all indications of masculinity. It's very, very simple to understand I mean, a cow should look like a cow and a bull should look like a bull. It's as simple as that. What's the best advice? Best advice is carve at the right time. 
at the appropriate time. And then if you had the option uh, and you could, in terms of grazing, you force the cattle to eat all the grass there is, and then you'll be able to uh, go a, a long way through that drought. Yeah. I mean, months, they can make it months for it? I think if you, if you see how much grass is not grazed, if it's 25%, in my case it was 50%, let's say it's 25%, even a drought year. I've got photographs here in Namibia where they had to destock cattle where three quarters of the grass hadn't been grazed. But the cattle wouldn't graze it unless you forced them through high stock densities and quick moves and a very good protein supplement. If you can do that, then you can utilize all the grass. And you can actually ration as well on a daily basis, which is different to uh, grazing all the grass in the last month you've got no grass left. So you ration that right throughout to, what, to the end of the, your drought reserve, drought period. And then the carving at the right time, that's essential. The driest year on our record, I, I doubled my stocking rate. I doubled my stocking rate, the driest year on record. We had less than half our average rainfall. I doubled my stocking rate because in our environment there's a lot of ungrazed grass through conventional low density management. When by balancing with uh, uh, net gain energy for net gain or energy for maintenance, when you balance that way, it's sometimes precise, sometimes not. That was my experience. And I worked with, a, it was back then 10,000 head feedlot, now it's 40,000 head feedlot. And we always got the best results. And on dairies in Torreón, Coahuila, we, we had to compete with the best nutritionists in the world, sometimes from Israel, sometimes from the United States, and we also be beat them every time. So this, this works. Uh, this is in the last 12 years, my experience. So let me now try to, there. This is where we change the numbers, the percentages in the, ra in the ration, and we try to balance the amount of, first we balance the oxygen to 40.5, then we try to balance the hydrogen to the protein. 6% uh, hydrogen, 6.7% hydrogen requires 13% protein, so 6.75 requires 13.75. Now if we go here, this is what we can ex expect. If we have a hydrogen of 7.1, which requires a, a protein of 17, we can expect a rate of gain of 6.5 with a feed efficiency of 4 to 1. This is all in dry matter. Or in a milk cow, 25,000 pounds of milk and fat, because the fat is which determines the energy. So we were talking about a 6.1, we need a 7% protein, and we can expect them to gain 1.5 if, uh, if everything else is equal. And in a dairy cow, we could expect this. So for maintenance, we are on these two levels. Depends on environment and, and work done. So we work on this part and these percentages. Then we come to this other one. This will change automatically and give us the real values. This is an actual ration I made for a dairy, a grazed dairy, here in Florida. And then we go to the cost per pound of actual feed, uh, fed, and the cost in dollars total, and the cost per head per day. This is a dairy cow <coughs> in live oak. So by doing this ba uh, ration balancing, he, the, this man was able to spend like between four and five dollars less per cow per day, and he got uh, 10 pounds more of milk on average per cow per day. So he's happy. In some other situation, here is the, the common feed values. These were done by Mark and his lab. He had the machine to do it. So these are averages. So I prefer to see the cow and see the production. If milk or meat is the, the same. So I take the values from here and put, it, put them up here, here. And that gives me a good idea 
from a base to start. And then I, I change these values here, and I get the response here, which I try to balance the best I can to 40.5, and then do energy to the protein in this table. So it's pretty simple, but you need experience to know. Are there any computer programs that you just put in the feed to the amount and then it just calculates it for you and says bam? No, because this has to be done by approximation. You have to be changing the values up here, these ones, and then it will give you the values here. So bam, you get it, but you need to do it slowly by approximation. That's my experience. It takes a few minutes, not very fast, if you have experience. If you don't, it will take a little more minutes, but you get but it. you got to have all the numbers that you plug in. Yes, sir. The numbers are down here. Do you have copies of any of this? Or can you email it? Or? Yes, sir. We could, we could yes. Yeah. And, I, and I could teach you how to, to do it because it takes practice. Right. I was taught by him. Uh, that's the truth. It, yeah. it, took, it took many years for me to be proficient at it. Not many years, but how many years it took me? Well, maybe two. Maybe two years to be good. You had to do it a lot because dairy people are constantly changing their ranks. Yes, every visit they would change. Yeah, and, and in the beef industry, not things, things don't change near as drastic. Right. I mean, you don't rush out and feed alfalfa one day, and then the next day decide you're going to feed oats. Feed old hay or and then the next day decide you're going to feed oats instead of corn. You don't need that. You have more consistent. The changes you will have is, is when you have less green and then things start maturing, they'll change. And when it gets oxidized, then it changes. And about three or four times a year. Yeah. So all you have to do is to find out what those numbers are going to be because my numbers there For example, coastal uh, Bermuda hay is this, but Bermuda pasture, I calculated this, see? And it worked well. We got the pH correct, we got the production, we got the health in the cow, the reproduction. And by the way, these cows in the first three months, they gained like 150 pounds w while reducing the cost and increasing the production. So it was very cost effective. Yeah, 150 pounds or? I'm not, okay. Yeah. That is a lot. So, so that was worth money. She's smiling now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, it started raining. You don't change the numbers here because they will, it will accept you to change it, but they will ruin the program. You have to only work. You can, you can do the ones on the far left on the primary. These ones. Here it says. Jim, do you have uh, some oxygen and hydrogen values for your pastures over throughout the year? Uh, I I, I, for example, in the yeah, for example, in the green time of the year right now, it will be like this, but lower in protein here because we are in degraded soils. Uh, Arley has a much better soil because he's been grazing correctly for a number of years, so his organic matter went up. Here we have a 0.5 percent organic matter. So eventually we will get here, but not right now. We will be like a 10 percent protein on Bermuda. But in the energy, maybe 6.05. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, 
when it's dry, if we go to the to this, it will be maybe like this. Okay, no, no, that's not it. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't find anything that looks like. Maybe it's not so bad as this. It would be like a 41, 41 and a half oxygen, 5.7 hydrogen, and a 3 to 4 percent protein. That's what I can say from my experience. But it would be better to actually send a sample. How much is a sample to? Forty dollars. It would be better to send a composite sample. Okay, so you get the whole package. And that, like, send that to Dairy One, or I mean, where are you talking about sending that? To him. He has the lab. Okay. Yeah. So this is very handy. It helps to make balanced rations, and the results are predictable. That's that's what I can say. And as soon as, it's, as soon as it stops raining, we go out. I hope you all get, have rubber boots or some kind of boot. I've got another question. Yes. Uh, somewhere I saw you talking about um, sprouting Milo. Fodder. Yes. yes. I stopped doing that. Okay. It was a lot of work. Uh -huh. And the, res the results, I did it for six months to be sure. Now I can say. I, I sprouted it and fed it after three, four days because later it will have fungus. Mm -hmm. So then I, I went back to not sprouting it, just grounding it. And the results per pound of dry grain are the same in my experience. We didn't have any benefit but more work. Really? Yes. I'm sorry, but that's my experience. I know there's a lot of people pushing it now. Well, I, I, I decided to try the low cost way to do it just on, on, a, on a laminous. There's a lot of people selling some very expensive I systems. know, so I, I decided to do it the, the cheap way because Sabino Cortez told me how to do it. So I did it. And I tried it for a long time. And uh, no difference. So don't spend your money. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't going to, but okay. because if you want to see somebody that has a real fancy setup where three layers and they're on a conveyor belt and slowly goes forward and grows these and, and they feed it to dairy cows. Was, that device was made by an Amish customer of mine and up by Watkins Glen, New York. And uh, he asked me before he made this monster machine. I mean, it's like 40 foot long and about four foot wide. These belts go real slow and that's supposed to fall off the end of the piece. And, uh, and then he first learned about the sprouts, he, he wanted to know my opinion. And, uh, and I gave it to him straight and hard. And, and I said, uh, it does make it more digestible grain is more digestible, but like I said, the labor and the expense, you, you will be out of it within two years. Six months after he made this fancy machine, he said, you wouldn't be interested in buying that. He says, it's a piece of junk. Well, we made like 0.4 pounds more of milk per cow per day, but it wasn't worth it. So, no. so well, I decided to not do it. I think the application that's going around is a lot of people want to do grass fed. And so if they take their grain and sprout it and feed it that way, so that, it's not green. That might work. That might but for that, you need the machine, and it's a lot of money, so I didn't do it. The expense and the labor, there's no way to go that money. Because they analyze this a lot different than they used to on the TDN. Oh. So different. First we started with TDN, then we went to uh, energy requirement per pound of gain and uh, net energy, net energy for lactation, net energy for maintenance, which was a little better, but they are all made out of formulas, equations, that they predict that maybe that will be, but it's not a sure measurement. With this, this is an actual measurement of 
what's the percentage of oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen uh, in, in dry matter with a machine that actually measures it? If not, if not an equation. This device, this device uh, is used by the pharmaceutical companies and coal companies to check the purity of their products. That's, that's why it was mostly made. <laughs> uh, you can buy one yourself if you like. Uh, mine came out of Germany. It's called an Elementar. The one I had before that was made by Perkin and Elmer. Uh, they're widely used devices. Uh, uh, a few universities have them. The University of Georgia has one. And, uh, they, and most of them will do uh, the carbon hydrogen nitrogen uh, for $75 and then the oxygen is a little more and, uh, and that doesn't include the minerals. The only reason I bought one is because first off I couldn't afford to pay for everybody's feed tests and second of all nobody was going to send their feeds in there to get it analyzed for that kind of money so I bought one myself. The machine cost $63,000. What I have found what I have found is that I, if, I, if you want to be among the best in the world, you want to be world class in what you do, you have to seek the best people doing it, what you are interested in. And, and on my way of travels and reading and what I've been looking for, Mark is the best in nutrition and Johan is the best in anim adapt animal genetics and this grazing system. And uh, what I want to say is that the universities or college or research stations are like 20 to 30 year, years behind the private initiative that they go ahead and do it. They don't have to wait for approval. And if you think about it, in college, the, the persons that are teaching, they graduated 20, 30 years ago if they, if they had a master. So they are teaching us what they were taught a long time ago. If you want to be in the forefront, in the edge of development, you have to go to individuals that are out there doing it. That's, that's my experience. I was educated as an agronomy engineer, and uh, it was so sorry, so way behind of what I can find out there. And it took me time when Mark started explaining this. I got a headache because all my knowledge was against that. So it took me time to realize that he was correct. It was sound. Then came Johan and got a big headache for three days. And then I had to, to rearrange my thoughts. And, and I'm sure that's happening to some of you. And it takes time. It took me years. Now I, under, I understand much better. So it takes a while. But it's really good. If you go and see the heifers, we are feeding one pound of corn post. Here is 0.9, and that's for a, that's for a cow that is more. Let, cow yeah, let me change that. Uh, what? No, you got to go to the pounds uh, to the weight of the cow. Where is that? No, I don't have that. Uh, pounds of dry matter. It would be. Uh, let me see. Two and a half percent times your body weight. I need a. If you had Holsteins, it'd be three percent. Yeah. The if you had uh, bison, it'd be two percent. And I'm sure if you genetically pick your animals like Johan's doing, you're going to get closer that, to being more a more efficient animal, and they could actually get to probably two percent. This would be like a quarter of cornopus. The rest, I don't know. I did it in. Uh, I'm sorry. That's only uh, because in kilos, that's what it does. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Right. I, I am used to do so it in kilos. Then you have 2.2 times that then. Yeah, so it will be like 24. There. Half like half a pound of corner poles, it will cost you 33 cents per, ha per heifer per day. And this is what you will get. I'm giving a little more. I'm giving a one pound per day because I want to have them breed sooner because we had a drought last year and they came from New Mexico.
So that's more or less what we do. Okay. Any questions? Okay, that's yes, sir. So is this what you come up with? Two percent corner post and the rest? Yes, sir. Yeah, two percent of the of the dry matter intake of the animal needs to be corn post. And the rest is all pasture. So those numbers came out pretty good then? Yeah. Yeah. The here is uh, half a pound corn post and the rest is pasture for heifers that size that are out there. And this is the uh, uh, yeah, yeah, here we go. What was the height difference? 634? Yeah, we should get an, around this because this is for an animal that weighs how much? About a 500 pound animal. Yeah, and these are like 450, I, I guess, average. So well, it will be well, over, over, over two pounds of gain, yes, we're getting. No, because one of the other things that occurs is sometimes we have cloudy weather and sometimes we don't have that hydrogen. Sometimes we do have the hydrogen. We have been it's feeding nice them. Everything was perfect, but it doesn't. We have been feeding them for 20 days now. And we're, I, I want to keep it till the end, not the end, but till 20 days before the end of the breeding season, which for them will be 42 days for the heifers. If you have it, in uh, most cases, energy a little bit, and then go back and put uh, 4% in on hydrogen on the corner Yes, sir. 4%, that's what you're doing. And, and then reduce that to 96. All right, now go down to the totals. All right, so now we have a 663 and a 10. Let's go up to these numbers up here. 663, as you can see, it needs a 12 when we only have a 10. That means you have energy in excess of protein, which means you're going to put on fat, which you must have to produce estrogen. So he wants to get his these heifers bred. As your links in the tropics, yeah. 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 So what he did is put them on a kind of a fattening ration without grain so that you could get a bread. And you saw on the tail the, the fat deposits on the sides. I don't think you really needed to feed that much, but that's what he's doing. Well, we want to increase the number of cattle. Yeah. The reason you wouldn't be able to do it with corn is because in the rumen you're dealing with you know, uh, let's call it three major groups of bacteria. The two biggest ones are proteobinic, those are the bacteria yes. that digest grains. And cellulolytic digests this Bermuda grass, this, this hay. And if you use corn in the ration, you're going to depress the growth and multiplication of the cellulose digester. And since that's 98% of your ration, why would you want to do that? You need to put in a source of energy that promotes digestion of cellulose. That's why that stuff was made back in 1951. We've had it a long time. Yeah, you know, we've made some changes, but nonetheless, that's why, that's why it's made. It doesn't fit a high grain ration, a 80% grain ration very well. You don't really need that. You don't need cellulose for, uh, digestion on a high grain ration, so it's not as important. Okay. Did it stop raining? Yes, it did. There you go. Okay. There it is.